we thought this would be a good day to have this discuss this topic because tomorrow, which is the 16th of May, is the annual hereditary and Joedima day. And um, usually that is a day when the hereditary and Joedima community worldwide um, just creates awareness on hereditary and Joedima, abbreviated as HAE, just so that we can um, be able to accurately and easily diagnose this condition though rare, you know, it exists among us, and with that, we can improve care for people with HAE. So welcome to today's webinar. Our first speaker will be Dr. Priya Bauri. Dr. Bauri is an allergist based in Nairobi at the Allergy Clinic in Upper Hill. And um, she's also a um, knowledgeable doctor on, on hereditary angioedema, and she'll be taking us through the clinical diagnostic approach to allergic and hereditary angioedema. Dr. Bowery is also the regional medical advisor for HAE International. Welcome, Dr. Bowery. You may begin. Thank you so much, and thank you, KNH, for uh, for having me uh, today, it is a it is a great pleasure, and uh, it's HAE Day tomorrow, so I think this is very timely. Um, and thank you all for attending. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, I'm going to cover quite a lot today. I'll try and be quick and brief, but but there is a lot to cover because, um, and I'd I'd like to cover some angioedema cases as well if I have some time. Um, it's important to know that angioedema. Um, and other forms of edema can get mixed up. And we do see patients with other forms of edema presenting. Uh, and remember, if they're chronic and they've been there for a long time and they're persistent, symmetric, and they're pitting, um, and they're long-lasting, they're gravitational dependent, um, and there's likely to be some other cause, and it's unlikely to be angioedema because angioedema tends to be recurrent and self-limiting, um, non-pitting. It can occur quite quickly over minutes to hours and last up to days, but is not chronic um, in its in its picture, and it typically is not gravitational and not asymmetrical. Um, so, and it may be associated with other features of allergy or anaphylaxis, which is unlike um, with the other forms of edema. Um, we have all seen cases of angioedema, um, which is this deep tissue swelling uh, where you have increased permeability of the blood vessels, um, which, which then cause this edema. And it's caused by a number of mediators. Um, uh, which we are going to talk about and cover today. Um, and they may, and it may or may not occur in the presence of urticaria. So a lot of us are very familiar with histamine mediated angioedema. Some of us remember medical school days when we heard about bradykinin. Um, so I'm going to talk about that today. So in terms of your histamine mediated angioedema, this is where you see your allergic patients with IgE or non-IgE mediated disease and pseudoallergy. Bradykinin mediated uh, disease tends to be because uh, of functional C1 inhibitor deficiency, which is what where we talk about hereditary angioedema and acquired angioedema. And if the normal, if the levels of C1 inhibitor are normal, then that can be caused by other, or the other mutations, um, which, which we'll talk about again. Um, in terms of mast cell mediated disease, we see it in a number of different manifestations. This, in the skin, you will have urticarias, angioedema. These, these tend to be itchy. We may have flushing of the skin. You have associated ENT symptoms with rhinitis. Um, with the chest, you might have bronchospasm, wheezing, coughing. The GI symptoms tend to be uh, uh, related to abdominal pain, vomiting, and the gastroenteropathies. And of course, these are the patients who are at risk of anaphylaxis. Most of these patients do have a family history of ATP, and we all know the management of allergies. That is avoidance of the known triggers, antihistamines, 
corticosteroids, leukotriene antagonists, and others. Bradykinin mediated uh, angioedema is different. You tend to have massive angioedema. These patients don't have urticaria typically, and these are not itchy. They may or may not have preceding erythema marginatum. And these are not atopic patients for the most part. Uh, though, of course, you can have atopic patients with, with HAE. Uh, they do have GI symptoms. They have abdominal pain, swelling, vomiting, and diarrhea. Typically, these things build up from hours and last days. The biggest risk here is laryngeal obstruction, and there is a strong family history in these patients. They are refractory to antihistamines and steroids. They have a whole other gamut of treatments and prophylaxis, which we are going to talk about later. In terms of Kenya and the commonest causes of angioedema, we must remember common things are common. And so we start off by the commonest things, which is your mast cell mediated disease, your allergies, your pseudo allergies, your drug allergies. When you talk about other things that cause angioedema, very common in our patients are infections, uh, the arthritis, uncontrolled diabetes. Um, and then we do see a huge number of patients with acquired uh, C1 inhibitor, a normal C1 inhibitor with ACE inhibitors and AT2 antagonists. So it's important to know these causes before we come to the rarer causes, uh, which we still have to know about and know how to investigate. So in terms of a diagnostic approach, these are very challenging. Angioedema is always very challenging um, because you have to work your way through a number of different differential diagnoses, um, especially if the symptoms are refractory or they are minimally responsive to therapy or they were responsive and now they're not responsive to therapy. So you need to take a very thorough medical history to do a good examination and then be methodological in your approach. If you are, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. If you are concerned about life-threatening reactions, you need to make sure you offer patients good advice. <coughs> sorry, they may need adrenaline or to injectors and you need to tell them what to do in case of laryngeal obstruction. <coughs> <coughs> sorry. <coughs> these patients need a very good history. It's always useful to have local, the pictures of local skin. So you are able to demonstrate to your patients what it looks like and confirm that that is actually what they have. And it helps to know the names in the local language. You want to know about the age of onset, <coughs> sorry, timing, duration, see, du duration, frequency of attacks, severity, what parts of the body are affected? Are there any other associated features? Are they painful? Are they itchy? <coughs> we need to know whether urticaria is present or not. Do these patients have demographism? Because it will allow you to differentiate between the different causes. Are there other associated symptoms of allergy? What, is, what does the patient think triggers their symptoms? Does it happen after stress, after trauma? Is it related to menses, stress, or infections? How severe has this disease been? Have they been to hospital? Have they had adrenaline? Have they had intubations? And how have they responded to all these different therapies? Is there a history of atopy and other allergies in the patient, autoimmune disease, hypertension, diabetes? Do they have any other comorbidities? And what about family history of all of those? Have they traveled? Have they had any recent infections? Or do they, have they had any fevers? What about their occupation? And what prescriptions are they taking? What supplements are they taking? Are they on any herbal medications or supplements? And then you need to take a dietary history and a very good, strong drug history. 
if the patient has acute severe facial edema and they may or may not have tongue swelling, you need to consider managing this as a medical emergency and you need to be ready for it. When you examine the skin, you must look for excoriations, dermographism, and other features of urticaria. Remember, your investigations are going to be directed by this good history and this useful examination. And what are the investigations? Well, they're based on the history. And we have to think about allergy tests with provocations. We need to think about infections and what the appropriate investigations for infections are. We need to think about whether these patients might need drug tests and eliminations and re-challenges. What blood tests might be required? Do we need to consider any other types of stimulation tests? And if we consider HAE, what are the appropriate tests for that? Remember, you're not going to get your answers quickly. It can take between three weeks to three months with regular follow-up to really find out what the cause is of this angioedema. And if you're uncertain, please don't sit on these patients, refer them to someone who knows. <coughs> Sorry. In terms of infection, one must always ask about fever, travel abroad, people who work up country or in different remote parts of the world, and other warning signs, such as an unwell child. Typically in viral infections in children, they will have a short history of angioedema with urticaria. Typically there'll be a history of fever, upper respiratory tract infections, urine infections, or GI symptoms. There's a variety of weird and wonderful bugs that can cause angioedema in our patients. So typically stool tests ought to be done. And sometimes they're recurrent and resistant to treatment. One must always think about these patients and what medication they are on, because sometimes they do react to the medication that they've been given, such as the antibiotics. And of course, your investigations are directed by the history. In terms of allergies, I can go on and on about this, but I'll be quick. Remember, you have to think about diet, environment, drugs, and occupation. The commonest, of course, being food allergy, pseudo allergies, and drugs. We see a number of patients with angioedema who have dust mite allergies, molds, and of course, pets. Typically, they do have urticaria, as I said before, and other manifestations of allergic disease. Remember, whichever test you do, whether it's the skin prick test or the serum specific Ig test, must be followed by a challenge and has to be directed by the patient's diet and the local aerobiology. This is what a skin prick test looks like. If you come to my clinic, this is what you'll see me doing. We're looking for a wheel and flare reaction when we do the skin prick test. Remember whether it is serum specific IgE test or the skin prick test, a positive result signifies sensitization, not clinical disease. One has to follow, especially for food allergy, one has to follow with an oral food challenge and other provocation tests. Undiagnosed allergies risk continued exposure to that allergen and of course possible progression to anaphylaxis, which is life-threatening uh, uh, allergic uh, reaction. So one must be aware and one needs to know and arm the patient with adrenaline. ACE inhibitors and AT2 antagonists are a very, very common cause in our patient cohort. Um, and they often present with tongue swelling. These patients, we have to liaise with the cardiologists or the secondary care physicians before we eliminate these drugs from their diet because they need to be given suitable alternatives uh, when you take them off medication. Otherwise, their blood pressure goes off, which we don't want. We also must always ask patients about non-steroidal drugs because these, we know, again, commonly present with angioedema. 
not as often, we do see patients with diabetes, which is uncontrolled, and thyroid dysfunction presenting with angioedema. Hereditary angioedema. This famous man in 1988, so William Osler, in 1888, I'm sorry, in 1888, described a 24-year-old female with recurrent episodes of painless, non-pruritic swellings. They typically lasted one to four days, affecting various parts of the body. More severe episodes resulted in abdominal colic, nausea, and vomiting. They came on their own and no specific triggers were found. When he took a family history, it revealed they were present in 28 other family members in the preceding five generations. And he concluded that these local swellings in various parts of the body, and in some cases, death resulted from a sudden edema glottitides. It was associated with edema and most of the patients had gastrointestinal disturbances. And there was a very strong marked hereditary disposition. He obviously took a long time taking this history and considering these patients. So what is HAE? It is a disease of the calocrine kinin system where due to C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency or dysfunction, you end up with uncontrolled production of bradykinin, which causes the severe angioedema. It is considered a primary immunodeficiency. It is very rare, affecting about one in 30 to one in 50,000 people, and it is autosomal dominant. While we know urticaria and angioedema are very, very common, in fact, up to 30% of our population, HAE only accounts to about 2% of this total 30%. Remember, these patients are at risk of severe life-threatening uh, disease if they have laryngeal involvement. As I mentioned, the swellings are massive, they're not itchy, they do not respond to antihistamines, and urticaria is typically not present. The low levels of plasma C1 inhibitor are because of mutations in the C1 inhibitor gene, which is then transmitted. In about 20% of the population, they have de novo or new mutations. <coughs> C1 inhibitor is very important, and it plays a role as a breaking mechanism, as an inhibitor, as a very potent inhibitor in a number of pathways, the complement, coagulation, contact, and fibrolinetic pathways. And in these pathways, it inhibits a number of different very important mediators which result and regulate bradykinin production. If you have dysfunctional or deficient C1 inhibitor levels, due to increased bradykinin production, you res it results in angioedema. Um, and here you can see trauma affecting uh, and activating the contact system. It leads, leads to uncontrolled um, activation of factor 12 <coughs> and, and formation of calocrine, um, an increase in plasmin uh, because of activation of the fibrillinistic system, and then high molecular weight kininogen releases the, uh, uh, the bradykinin. <coughs> the bradykinin acts on these receptors on the endothelial cells, <coughs> which cause extra extravasation of fluid through the endothelial cells. <coughs> Sorry, please forgive me. <coughs> so bradykinin is very important. It is the primary mediator of swelling 
<coughs> in HAE. It has a number of very important normal functions. And homeostasis, <coughs> immune responses, inflammation, vascular tone, and permeability. The three types <coughs> sorry, the three types of HAE are type one, type two, and HA with normal C1. It affects all races and genders equally in type one and two. Starting early in life in the first and second decade, in HAE with normal C1 in, with normal C1 inhibitor. This tends to affect women more and start, <coughs> sorry, after puberty. <coughs> in HAE type one, there are low levels of C1 inhibitor and low levels of C4. <coughs> in HAE type two, this is mainly where the dysfunctional C1 inhibitor plays a role. And as I mentioned, in HAE with normal C1, you will have normal C1 levels and function, but there are mutations of factor, factor 12, angiopoietin 1, and the plasminogen genes. This tends to affect women mainly and is estrogen dependent. All these have a very, require a very strong family history of angioedema. So how does it present? These patients have these episodic attacks. They're non-pitting, non-pruritic, painful, well circumscribed. Urticaria, as we've mentioned, is absent. And they start from childhood, less frequent and mild, increasing in severity as they get older from adolescence. They can have abdominal symptoms. They can, they can last for days. <coughs> hereditary hereditary is, is one of the biggest features in up to 80% of the cases, and 20 can be new mutations. There are some prodromal symptoms like erythema marginatum and other nonspecific symptoms. <laughs> what precipitates HAE? Trauma, surgical procedures, dental procedures, physical stress, hormones, pregnancy, menstruation, infections, emotional stress, medication, such as estrogens, contraceptives, HRT, ACE inhibitors. And in a large number of patients, we never know what is the trigger. The laryngeal edema, which is the big thing we're worried about, <coughs> can look like this when you through a scope. Tongue swelling can be massive. And here you see your typical erythema marginata. <clears throat> During an HAE abdominal attack, there is massive swelling in the abdomen, and it can often mimic an acute abdomen. <clears throat> the cheapest, most reliable test, screening test, is the serum C4 level. And during an attack, it is almost always low. If you have a normal C4 level during an attack, it is unlikely to be HAE type 1 or 2. C1 inhibitor levels ought to be done for any patient with a low C4 who have a good history of angioedema. In terms of the principles of management, there are three approaches. One wants to approach an acute treat, the, the acute attack. We want, one wants to manage and give the patient maintenance or prophylaxis and pre-procedural, because this is the time when the patient is at the highest risk. 
If you look at the dates on this, FFP and tranexamic acid have been used for years. Modern medication has only really been around since 2008. So it's not long. We've been using these medications, these old medications like FFP and tranexamic acid for many, many years. And we hope that we'll be able to access the modern medication to help our patients in the acute um, phases and also have access to maintenance for them. So what, is, what are the therapeutic interventions? Plasma-derived C1 inhibitor concentrates, recombinant C1 inhibitor concentrates, calocrine inhibitor, radikinin receptor antagonists, FFP and tranexamic acid. For maintenance, we also have danazol added to our gamut. And these can be used for procedures. In the acute phase, the first thing you have to do is stabilize your patient. You have to manage their airway. And depending on what is available, one needs to approach it. You also need to give supportive therapy in terms of pain management, IV fluids, monitoring and other supportive care. These patients must have a personal action management plan for what to do in an emergency, how to manage an acute attack and their prophylaxis. What do you do? If you're unable to do the C4 test or the C1 inhibitor test, if it's unaffordable, but the history is good and compatible with HAE, what then? We may, we may consider a therapeutic trial of danazol or tranexamic acid for four to six weeks, but we have to monitor the patients closely and assess response to treatment. It's important to remember patients on danazol need, uh, those ones on prophylaxis need regular follow-up. There are some adverse effects and remember it must be avoided in pregnancy and lactation. So I'm gonna talk to you about some cases of angioedema. Uh, one is a 43 year old Swedish lady who was working for the Red Cross in Ethiopia and we saw her with recurrent angioedema and occasionally had hives over the previous six months. And she had um, intermittent abdominal pain um, and bloating. She did not have any family history of angioedema. Stool tests confirmed multiple bugs, uh, which we treated, her symptoms cleared. She went back to uh, Ethiopia to continue her work and she came back uh, over, sev over several uh, times with multiple bugs. Uh, they were very interested in Sweden. Uh, they did, uh, the infectious disease people were, were totally excited by her. Um, this was a, a, a child with a two-year-old child, little boy with urticaria and angioedema, referred for urticaria and angioedema after having antibiotics for a, a viral infection. Um, by day seven, he was very unwell with macular rash, which was not itchy and very painful angioedema of the hands and feet. Um, and he had lip dermatitis and conjunctivitis and he wasn't responding to antihistamines or steroids or fluids. Um, and actually, we diagnosed Kawasaki's in this little boy. Um, and he was treated with IVIG and did very well um, with no cardiac sequelae. Uh, this is a friend of mine who, uh, who had profound lip angioedema over two months. Uh, and eventually, he realized there was every time he ingested alcohol. And we confirmed a yeast allergy, which was call, causing his angioedema. There was a very strong psychological element to his, his uh, angioedema as well. Uh, this was a, a, a lady who, who presented with uh, recurrent urticaria, angioedema at night, 
um, which was worsening in severity. She was using up to 10 antihistamines a day. I'm not sure who was giving them to her uh, or who was giving her these multiple steroid injections. Uh, we found that she was allergic to all the nuts, beef, and milk, but the angioedema, the nocturnal angioedema, was brought out on by house dust mites, um, which was very significant. And when she controlled it, she did very, very well. This was a sad little case of a five-month-old baby who was failed uh, a number of times. She presented in, in casualty with three episodes of going floppy with angioedema and urticaria. Finally, on the fourth episode, she was found to be hypotensive uh, and, and, and was given a diagnosis of anaphylaxis. And we found that she was reacting to banana and avocado in, in both her and the mom's diet. Uh, this was a 59-year-old gentleman with uh, an eight-month history of angioedema, occasionally urticaria. He was non-atopic um, and no family history of atopy. Uh, and he was a diabetic with a family history of hypothyroidism. He didn't have any history of GI infections, no travel abroad. And uh, we, we found that his HbA1c was uncontrolled. We got him to see, go back to his diabetologist. They stabilized him and everything settled down. This is a 59-year-old Indian man with hypertension, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, and he came in with recurrent eyelid angioedema and one episode of tongue swelling. He was on ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aspirin, metformin, the whole gamut. And here, this gentleman was uh, an angioedema caused by his ACE inhibitors, and it resolved on alternative treatment. This is an interesting case. A five-year-old little boy who came from West Africa with a mild eyelid um, angioedema for going on for the last three weeks. He was well, no history of atopy, no family history, no pets. Um, stool tests were fine, food tests were fine. We eliminated spices and pseudoallergens from the diet. And then we went back and followed this child up. And we realized that he would only react in one of the rooms. And that one room had a mosquito chip in it that was different to the other rooms. And so when they excluded that, and re-exposed him again, it confirmed the symptoms because he developed angioedema again. So it's actually very important to take, to, to follow these patients up and really spend a bit more time. Uh, this was a 49-year-old Indian lady with hypothyroidism. She was on thyroxin with increasing angioedema in frequency. Uh, she was an atopic patient. Um, there was no family history of angioedema. Um, she didn't have any problems with food. She did have some rhinitis with dust mites, but she had a positive serum autologous test um, and she traveled to India. Uh, so we didn't see her again. Um, the, another interesting patient was a 51 year old Indian man with a history of rashes and angioedema who turned out to have lupus. Uh, recently, we saw a two-and-a-half-year-old Somali girl who was referred for allergy tests with a two-month history of severe painful swellings, unresponsive to antihistamines. This child was in agony. She had so, such severe pain. She was immobilizing herself, wouldn't let anybody touch her or maneuver her, only let her dad carry her. It affected only the elbows, the wrists, the hands, and the feet. That it started with a febrile upper respiratory tract infection. There were no hives on the body. And the mom reported intermittent fever. The CRP was persistently raised over two months, over a two-month period. This child was in so much pain. There was no way this is angioedema. I referred this patient to the pediatric rheumatologist who prescribed non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and within two days, the child was running around. My last case is a 41-year-old lady from Embu. She's a new patient. She's had angioedema since the age of two, affecting her face, hands, legs, and buttocks. No rashes, never responded to any antihistamines or steroids. 
severe premenstrual attacks affecting her face and larynx. She doesn't have abdominal swells and daily symptoms within the last year affecting her hands and feet. Um, she was diagnosed by her doctor with HAE and she was put on tranexamic acid and, and montalogy. Her son also has HAE symptoms that they're milder and they affect the genitals and the legs. Her C4 level was low. We requested a C1 inhibitor uh, level, which was low. It was sent off to South Africa and it was low. We counseled her with a family member and with HA Kenya patient support with us. She was given a written action plan for prophylaxis and acute emergencies. And we advised her to use the tracker app on her phone, which allows you to record the frequency of your symptoms. We commenced Danazol and we applied for Icatabant, which is the bradykinin uh, receptor antagonist through the IPR access program. And we advised her regular monthly follow-up so we could assess how she was doing. This was not maintained. As we last saw her, she has had swellings of her hands and feet every other day, so not as frequently. She has not, uh, she did not go and get FFP at her last severe facial swelling, uh, despite the written action plan. So of course, we now have concerns about compliance, record keeping, and maintaining follow-up. These patients require intensive education, involvement with the family and the local doctors. I've had to put in a phone call to the doctor to advise them that they need to get FFP for her in case she has an emergency. So the agony is real for the patients. They fear, they fear anaphylaxis, laryngeal obstruction, and death is real. It's uncomfortable. There's a massive psychological impact. They lose days of work, school, and income. Medications abused, as you've seen in some of the cases. Hopping from doctor to doctor to alternative practitioners to herbal medic med to medic herbal herbalists and everywhere else in between inappropriate diets, non-validated tests. HA is complex and it requires the doctors and the patients to cooperate with each other. The challenges in Africa are missed diagnosis, lack of education amongst the doctors, lack of availability of access, healthcare access and health access to tests. They're expensive. Lack of availability of modern medication, or if it is available, it's very expensive. We need local HA focus support su focus groups to support the patients. Patient advocacy is very important. We need to be able to access and change policy. It's important to have registries HAE International is a valuable resource for doctors and for patients. I really urge the doctors to join HAE Kenya and help build this education network. It's only me and Annie at the moment, guys. So come on, pull, pull together. So in conclusion, it's important to know that local in, in local disease and local context, common things are common, but we should always have a very high index of suspicion. I always tell my colleagues, you must trust your intuition because you're usually right. If it doesn't look right or feel right, don't go for it. You need to trust yourself and trust your intuition. It's important to take a careful history. It'll save time and money. If you're unsure what to do, refer in a timely manner. Remember, undiagnosed allergies risk anaphylaxis, undiagnosed HAE risks laryngeal obstruction. And we don't want that on our hands. The burden of angioedema is very real and it's very significant for the patient. And for the doctor who's looking after these patients, it's also very real. The patients can be managed very, very well if the correct causative diagnosis is established. 
and these patients can have a full and good quality of life. HAE awareness is of utmost importance as a mixed missed diagnosis could be fatal. And with that, I'm done. And I'm very sorry about my cough. Okay, um, thank you, Priya, for that excellent presentation. Um, I think uh, we, we, ha we, we have time for some questions. I'll just see what is on the chat. Okay. Um, <coughs> Um, Karia would like you to comment on this statement that angioedema is not always seen in anaphylaxis. Um, I don't know whether that was a question or just a comment and he's asking for comments. Maybe you can just. I, I agree. I mean, you, you know, anaphylaxis can affect, uh, requires two or more body systems to, to, to qualify uh, and it can be any two. You don't have to have angioedema. Typically, these patients will have a good history of, they may have, uh, it may affect different body, body systems uh, from respiratory to skin to, you know, you may get, uh, you, they, they have multiple symptoms. And uh, of course, Cardio, cardiac, cardiac, uh, you know, you can have go into cardiorespiratory shock as a result of, of anaphylaxis. So it's not always angioedema, but they do present with multiple, uh, the, it is, it is multi-system uh, and they often do. Yes. Okay. There's another question for you um, on allergens. So the question is, what is common in peanuts, beef, and milk? What are the allergens involved? Different different foods have different allergens. They're all they they're proteins, uh, which are not only those are not the only uh, food allergens. You can react to you can react to any food. Uh, most foods will have some proteinous um, elements to them, which one can react to. And there are different and many allergens in different foods uh, and different allergens within these different foods can have different levels of allergenicity and cause different reactions. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Dr. Kamenwa, she says, great presentation, Priya, very informative. So the question is, does a normal C4 conclusively rule out the possibility of hereditary angioedema? It, if during a severe attack, the C4 level is normal, it is unlikely. But if there is a good history, then I would request a C1 inhibitor level. I think, I think especially if we are going to be trying to get modern medication for patients, I think a conclusive C1 level is important if we're going to try and uh, access these things through the access programs, they do require some uh, numbers. So if the C4 level is normal, but the history is good, I would do a, I would do a C1 inhibitor level. But for the most part, C4, if it's normal during an attack, uh, I would probably consider other causes. Okay. From your discussion, what is the role of bugs in HAE? Infections can uh, trigger HAE attacks. Uh, that's clear. Yeah, I think that was clear from your talk. What is your advice on the management of cold and heat urticaria? You know, when you identify patients who have uh, specific triggers for urticaria, you have to advise them to try and avoid those specific triggers. And it's difficult, you know, uh, you can manage them with antihistamines and, uh, but you can manage them. But at the end of the day, avoidance of the trigger is what is going to, um, it is going to be the mainstay of management. And it's difficult for our patients. I mean, we have 
children with exercise-induced uh, tacharia and angioedema, and they, they hate it because they can't participate in sport. It, these are very real things, and it's tough. Okay. Okay, um, a question from Joseph Mitini. How would you comment on urticaria and itchiness associated with taking a bath? Especially, uh, typically the episode lasts up to 30 minutes after the bath with severe itchiness. Yeah, this is, we see this in a number of patients. Some of them, um, and, and you know, these are self-limiting. They tend to come on, uh, some patients find that um, it's worse if they have dry skin. And if you manage the dry skin with good emollient therapy, then their symptoms are better. Some find it's temperature related. So it's related to the temperature of the water. Some say it's related to the temperature of the room when they come out into a cold room. If they have it later in the day in a warmer environment, it happens less. You really have to spend time and take a good history, get the patient to observe their symptoms and then adapt their life. Okay. Um, there's a comment from Dr. Okongo, who's a pediatric rheumatologist. Um, he says, great talk. And just to reiterate that C1 inhibitor deficiency may also be a genotypic manifestation of SLE. So if it's not HAE, think of lupus as a differential. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so Irene Olo asks whether we have, um, or do you have statistics as to the prevalence based on Kenyan facts? Um, I, have, I have two patients and one patient's son. I'm sure there are many patients out there. That's why we are doing this talk. We are trying to raise awareness. We're trying to create patient registries. We want more doctors involved who will refer because we do have access to, uh, uh, to Firazir, Akataband, um, and we can only access this therapy if we have patients. Okay, and I think just to reiterate, it is a hereditary disorder. It's a rare disease, but you know the aim of creating awareness is so that we can actually think about it. The eyes only see what the brain knows so without um, registries, it's difficult to talk about the, the prevalence or the incidence of the disease, but it does exist. Is angioedema a diagnosis of exclusion? And what are the essential tests to confirm or to rule out angioedema? Maybe you can just pick up on that quickly. It is absolutely a diagnostic challenge, and uh, it is by, by exclusion. You, you, there isn't you do have to take a good history and your history will direct the investigations. As I talked about, you can, you may need to consider allergy tests, you need to consider infections based on the history, uh, the age of the patient or their, are their fevers or anything that might suggest this is caused by an infection. What is the family history? You know, we, we talked about all the different causes, um, of angioedema, and you now need to work your way systematically through the different causes, which I talked about earlier. Uh, if you missed that, then I can you can just contact me and I'll go through it with you again. Okay. Um, I see a lot of questions on, on articaria. I, I think probably in the future, Dr. Priya will invite you for, for another webinar on this. Um, there's sure. a a comment from Dr. Kipiator. He says, thank you for the awesome presentation. He's a dermatology resident and commonly sees patients with urticaria and rarely angioedema. So he'd like you to comment on use of the EpiPen in relation to angioedema. I think um, you, if for a patient who has um, allergic angioedema, who has presented uh, with severe with severe angioedema, and one is still working them up until you know the cause. And even if you do, once you have a good history that this is allergic 
um, angioedema and you're trying to work them up, a lot of these patients benefit, especially if they have a good history of severe allergic reactions. So that absolutely, I think I think we under prescribe epipens um, because of lack of uh, knowledge uh, about use of epipens. We're not doctors; don't know how to uh, use them. And um, what happens is that patients are uh, often not given when they ought to be given EpiPens. It's better to be safe than sorry. If you're worried about a patient, give them an EpiPen. Okay. How do we manage angioedema at pharmacy level as we refer them to hospital? At as in the hospital, well, in a pharmacy setting, you, we know that allergic um, angioedema typically will respond to antihistamines and, and steroids. I think antihistamines are reasonable. I think steroids ought to be uh, prescribed by, by doctors um, because otherwise they end up with uh, uh, steroid abuse. We have seen a number of patients who are who have you know got severe side effects because of steroid abuse and i think we need to be very judicious about that okay i agree with that uh, dr andarathi um thanks you for your presentation and asks how common is it or what explains adults who develop foods as their trigger for urticaria would this be more relevant in children I think it's relevant at all ages. Um, you can develop a food allergy at any time in your life. It is not only relevant in children. And we see patients uh, turning up at the age of 60, 70, and 80 with a uh, new onset of allergies. I think one has to look at, um, especially that a lot of these patients may even have a history of allergy or have been atopic in the past and not even realize, or there may be a family history of, of allergy. Remember the background risk of developing allergy is 12% in a normal population, in, a, in, a, in a, an individual who has never, who has no family history of allergy. And that's a background risk. So that risk increases if there's a family history and the more num the higher number of uh, affected in the family, but I think the you know anybody at any age can develop allergy, um, and we see it. So I, I don't think it's only relevant to children. Okay, please advise on the important allergy tests in our environment. In our environment, we have to look at um, the dust mites, moles, cockroach allergen, pollen, pets. Um, and of course, other uh, exposures. It depends on, uh, you know, occupational exposures, et cetera. Okay. Um, from Dr. Muyonga, what about itchiness during long walks or exercise? We see cholinergic urticarias quite a bit. Uh, and we actually do provocation tests on these patients. Um, and I get them running up and down the stairs and measure, you know, observe them and we take measurements and things uh, because we have had patients who have, who get urticaria and angioedema and even anaphylaxis uh, with exercise. So we need to know what they can do, how much they can do before they are at risk. So okay. we do see these patients, but they respond to antihistamines. Uh, if their symptoms are mild, they tend to respond to antihistamines well. Okay, um, I'll ask you two more questions. So you mentioned a relationship with hypothyroidism. Is there any link with Hashimoto's? Um, you know, it's quite rare, but I, I think probably to they pro maybe I don't know. Um, that's probably the best answer I can give you. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Um, does fungal infection enhance symptoms of angioedema? No, I don't think so. Okay. And finally, um, Dr. Itobu, Itobi says uh, many times she receives patients with um, oral thrush, adults, um, and is asking what could be the cause and, this, and that it's recurrent. 
I think if you see an adult with recurrent oral thrush, uh, it's probably a good idea to check their di their sugar. I think that's probably the commonest cause in, especially in older adults for uh, oral thrush. And then you need to make sure they don't have any other immunodeficiencies and things like that. But okay. you know, I'm not. I'm not a. a <laughs> I think one. There's there's probably others who can answer that question better than me. Um, yes, but I, I agree with you. Um, you'd like to just um, affirm their immune status, and I think diabetes and any other cause of, especially a secondary immunodeficiency, would apply here, including right. HIV. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you again, Dr. Priya. Um, I would you. now like to invite. Patricia Karani, who will take us through uh, patient perspectives. Um, Patricia is the regional patient advocate for Sub-Saharan Africa. She works for Hereditary Angioedema International. So we'll get to hear more about this um, specific condition. Welcome, Patricia. Hello. Hi. Hi, you can hear me? We can hear you. Um, you can. Okay, can you see? Yes, we can, you can see. see my screen? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity, Dr. Ambaraza, and uh, thank you, Dr. Priya, uh, for uh, highlighting the 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 the, in, the 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 medical aspect of HAE. So I am a patient living with HAE uh, in Kenya. Um, I am also the regional patient advocate uh, for HAE International. I take care of patients in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm also the founder and CEO of HAE Kenya. So I'm gonna take you through my life uh, experience uh, to getting a diagnosis and what living with HAE uh, looks like for a patient. So we've all been explained to very well by Dr. Priya what HAE is, uh, that it's genetic, it manifests in massive swellings and there are different types of HAE. So um, there was a question that had been asked about prevalence and and due to my extensive work in the sub-Saharan region, um, I have seen a lot of gaps. Uh, these prevalences uh, are made, uh, were of course done in the European countries. So it's one to 30,000 to one to 50,000. But what we don't have is a prevalence rate in Africa. However, uh, due to my uh, extensive work in the region, um, I have discovered that there could probably be a gap or our prevalence rates in Africa are, diff are different probably compared to those in Europe and the US. So um, in Africa, there are confirmed cases um, that are around 100, they are, they are less than 150. And if we go via the prevalence rate, there should be around 43,000 HAE patients. Um, these are cases that I have uh, found in different countries, uh, like in Sudan, with a probability of 840. There's one confirmed case. In Senegal, we have two confirmed HAE cases. In Kenya, we currently have eight confirmed cases. Um, in South Africa, as you can see, they have quite a large number of confirmed cases, and yet their probability is about 2,000. In Mozambique, we recently confirmed one case. In Eritrea, we have three confirmed cases. Unfortunately, one uh, passed on last year due to HAE. And you know, it begs the question, where are these patients? If at all the prevalence rate is as it is, uh, one to 30,000 to one in 50,000, where are these patients? Are they in our hospitals? Are they in our private clinics? And I go further and ask myself, have they been ostracized by society? Why? Because unexplained swellings have actually brought about a lot of um, um, cultural difficulties for patients in the region. Um, and also 
Are they misdiagnosed? Are they underdiagnosed? Because HAE mimics allergy as Dr. Priya has very well uh, illustrated. I mean, when you look at a swelling from a HAE patient and one from allergy, we look the same. So is it underdiagnosed? Is it misdiagnosed? Is there failure to realize that, you know, allergy medications do not work on, or they do not resolve the HAE swellings? Or have these patients actually died? Because the mortality rate is pretty high. It's at 30%. So I wanna take you through my personal journey. This is my personal experience. And I normally share this everywhere I go because I think it shows that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. So earlier on in my younger life, I was misdiagnosed with uh, duodenitis, uh, typhoid. I've been told I have ulcers. My father, uh, the late, uh, was diagnosed with fish allergy. My brother was told he has food poison. I've also been uh, diagnosed with, underdiagnosed with allergy. That means I do have allergy. And yes, I am allergic to dust and mold. But, and as well as I did have H. pylori, although that was not really the, 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 you know, the, the, the only reason as to why I was having this severe angioedema. So my HA swelling started when I was eight years old, that young. So HA is actually a childhood condition. And it took about uh, 10 years later for a doctor in one of the major hospitals to come and tell me, I know what this is. This is angioneurotic edema. This is what HA was called back then. So it took a lapse of 10 years for actually me to get a proper diagnosis of what was ailing me. So in my family, there are six children in total and three have similar symptoms. So I have two brothers and myself, I'm the only girl who got HA. So HA is inherited because it came from my father who in turn inherited from my grandmother. And we have seen HA mortality in our, in our family because my grandmother, when she went to the shamba to till the land, uh, she started developing difficulties in breathing. She decided to go back to the house. And within a matter of hours, she was gone because the HAE had attacked her throat. So these are 10 years of desperation and despair. I never knew what I was suffering from. Uh, the medications I was being given was not working. So what did I do? I had to go to Dr. Google. And I know this is not very, uh, famous with many people, but uh, with many doctors, but this is what we resort to as patients because we are trying to get a solution to what is ailing us. And at the same time, my brothers who had traveled to the US were actually diagnosed with hereditary angioedema. So Dr. Google and my brothers who actually got proper uh, diagnosis confirmed to me that what I actually have was hereditary angioedema. So these are, these are actually my photos, and this is how the swellings, um, you know, how they present. My hands get swollen to maximum. There is no mild swelling when it comes to my HA. There's no mild. It, it swells until there's no more space for swelling. So that is my hand. Uh, my feet as well get swollen such that I am unable to actually walk. And the worst swellings I really don't enjoy are the stomach swellings. As you can see, that's a very distended stomach. And it comes with a lot of vomiting and severe pain. I have actually never felt so much. From between 1 to 10, I would say my HA stomach swellings are at 10. I would want to take you through an episode that I had, just, just one to get everything in perspective. So this was a facial swelling. And as you can see in less than two hours of onset. Now the onset was an acne on my face. And what I did to make it worse was to itch because I felt it was very itchy. And um, I decided to itch it and that triggered or started my swelling. So in less than two hours, as you can see, where I've pointed with my finger, there was already a very noticeable swelling. In less than five hours, as you can see again, the swelling was going towards my throat, through my lips, through my mouth and through my chins. As you can see, 
there is also severe swelling on the cheeks. In less than seven hours from onset, I had fully blown face and throat swelling, meaning I couldn't see, I couldn't swallow, and I couldn't breathe properly. So this is where, where I reached and said, now for sure, uh, just like um, my father struggles with this thing, it's me to struggle with it. And we hope uh, that I'll be alive. Interestingly, HAE subsides on its own. If you're lucky to go through the serious um, episode where you can't see and you can't swallow and you can't breathe. If you go through that within day three, as you can see, my face has started subsiding and it starts subsiding from where it started swelling. That is my lips. As you can see, they are much better. And within day seven, my normal face is back. Now, the interesting part about HA is that there's no evidence of prior trauma or severe swelling. However, this has impacted on my personal life. These are seven working days of not going to work. These are seven school days of not going to school. These are seven days in a month. So that to me is something very uh, significant. And it is actually uh, very, you know, debilitating for a HA patient. So I have to take you through my experience in the ER because this is the reality. When I went to the ER those many years ago, as I told you, it took 10 years to get proper diagnosis. There was actually the inability to, to, for the, the healthcare professionals to clinically identify, diagnose, and manage my HE. And there, were no, there are actually no clinical guidelines on how to properly you know, take care of a HA patient. So what medications are supposed to be given to HA patients? For example, they administered a lot of corticosteroids. This did not resolve my swelling. Um, there was a lack of, of, of recognition that FFP can actually be used for an acute attack. So I was there trying to tell the doctor, please give me FFP. And they're like, no, this is angioedema. We can't give FFP. Let's give you some more antihistamines, some more um, you know, uh, steroids. And also there was also the lack of uh, you know, recognizing that the 17 alpha alkylated androgens such as danazole, stanazole, oxadronol, and even tranexamic acid can be used as a prophylactic therapy for HA. There was also, you know, lack of knowledge on, you know, the non-steroidal HA medications such as C1 inhibitors and incatabant injections. Uh, they are actually not available in the country. However, Dr. Prius, uh, um, I mean, mentioned that there is a possibility of getting these injections, but actually back then they were not available at all. So what did I do? I stopped going to hospital. Why? Because I'm not getting any resolve. Whatever I was given always took me to the stage where I couldn't breathe, I couldn't swallow, and I couldn't see. So then I decided to go to the private clinics. And unfortunately, this is what I got. I was told I'm a walking time bomb. Doctors didn't want to handle my case. I was told I don't want any legal issues. Doctors didn't want to handle me because they didn't know actually what to do with me. And you know, it made sense. This is a rare condition. I don't know what to do with you. At one time I was told that these are just normal allergies it will get better with time. And I told that doctor, no, these are not normal allergies because I use allergy medicines and they don't work. Then at one point I was also told to go and Google and come back with the with 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 the papers that I've googled for another appointment, you know, and I found that a bit, you know, <laughs> interesting. But that was my experience at the private clinics. So you wonder. I mean, eight, almost at the age of eighteen is when I got proper diagnosis, and even after that, I was not put on proper medication. So how did I used to handle my attacks? Well, the truth is, I would stay at home because one. My, my attacks are, are, are precipitated by, um, you know, my periods. So every month I was unwell and I was swelling during, before or after my periods. And it became too expensive. Every month being hospitalized in Kenya is quite expensive. And this left me traumatized because one, this 
I mean, it threat this condition was threatening my existence. Anything that was threatening me being able to breathe and me encountering that excruciating pain from my stomach that made me even pass out, that left me traumatized. I was like, this thing is gonna kill me one day. So I would sit in my room and then I would make sure that I'm seated upright so that, you know, cause when I lied down on my bed, I found like the swelling moved faster. So I tried to sit up so that it doesn't block my larynx and I would just pray and hope that I'm gonna see another day. And another unfortunate thing, which Dr. Priya has mentioned is that I would overdose on the only medication I knew that those were steroids and antihistamines. And I would really overdose and I would do like almost 10 tablets a day just to try and see whether and pray that, you know, they don't block my larynx. Oh, that was the thing that scared me the most, the laryngeal swellings. So I would really overdose on my steroids and my antihistamines. I remember I would take celestamine and piritons together, like three tablets and push them down my throat because I knew I could feel the swelling going towards my throat and I really didn't want that. So it was actually impossible to handle severe HA attacks. So when, so why am I alive? I mean, many people have died. <laughs> um, how, how is it that I am able to now live a normal life? First and foremost, I discovered that there was an international patient support group and that I was not alone. That in itself gave me the motivation to fight to fight because I was like, if these people can stay alive, my grandmother died, people are dry, dying all over Africa. I can also be able to survive. So I realized that there were modern and effective medications that could stop the swelling in a matter of minutes. That was unbelievable to me. I couldn't imagine seven days of swelling can be minimized to a few minutes through a prophylactic medication. I, it was, it was I, I couldn't fathom that. And one thing I also realized is that there are prophylactic medications for HA in Kenya. They are readily available. I couldn't believe it. No doctor had ever given me any prophylactic medication to prevent me from swelling. So I developed a personal resolution that I will not only fight for myself with this knowledge, but I'm also going to fight for others and give them hope. And this is what that made me recognize my power to speak, my power to share and my power to help others. And this was the genesis of HAE Kenya Foundation. So a patient group, let me just give doctors a brief of a patient group because patient groups are very important. They create a source of comfort for patients such that I can share without any shame that I get swellings in my vagina, for example. Or a man can come and say, you know, my, my testicles are swollen. Or, you know, I'm swelling and I don't know what has happened. I mean, it creates a sort of comfort for patients. It alleviates depression. I was actually very depressed during my time when I didn't know what I had. The medications are not working. When I go to hospital, nobody's telling me what this is. It's not resolving. I'm just always in hospital. So it alleviates depression. It gives patient the will to live and to fight. It also supports them mentally and emotionally. I have also been able to raise awareness amongst the medical fraternity, and which is what I am doing today. And I'm very grateful for everybody who is on board listening. We have also been able to, to, to try and lobby government for government to recognize people living with rare conditions. So patient groups are honestly a powerhouse. So why, do, why is it important to, collect, to collaborate with healthcare professionals? One thing is that it has a high mortality rate of 30%. And HAE really is a condition where patients don't need to die. This is something that can be prevented. Death can be prevented. I am alive today because I met a group of doctors like Dr. Priya Bari and Dr. Anne Baraza who are able to listen and just handle me the right way. So another reason why we collaborate with healthcare professionals is because we, we, lo we, we lose a lot of time as patients being unwell. 
when a patient is not managed properly. I mean, I have lost friends, for example, because just when we are about to go for a trip somewhere, maybe to Mombasa, I am unwell, I am swelling, so I can't travel. Um, my productivity at work, as I told you, when I start swelling in seven days, I wonder which employee, which employer will allow you to be swollen twice in a month for seven days. I mean, your productivity level goes down. My performance in school went down because every time before exams, and as you heard, stress is, uh, is a trigger for HAE. I mean, I was sick. So at times I had to sit for special exams and at times, you know, it was very stressful trying to convince um, uh, the, the, the academia to give me, you know, pers private exams. And it also affects your economic power. I, as a woman, I mean, I can't work as hard or eight to five jobs um, or maybe work in a factory where I'm walking all the time because my feet are going to swell. I can't do manual work uh, as much because, you know, so it affects, it limits what powers I can be able to, you know, the economic power that I have. And it also has a very big toll on the mental health. I, I had stayed in a lot of fear and trauma for so many years. And you know, the worst trauma I had was, I don't wanna have a child because I don't want to give this to my own child because I know it's inherited. So there's a lot of mental health issues that go into having HAE. And this is why we are here talking to healthcare professionals. You need to help us as patients. You need to help, you know, think outside the boxes. It's not allergic injury edema. Could it be HAE? So how can doctors participate? We have a forum for Kenyan doctors where it's an online WhatsApp group where you can come in and speak and, you know, ask questions. And, and you know, they, we always share updated information on HA diagnosis and management in Kenya, as well as, you know, other international updates on how to manage HA and, and anything that is documented out there. We also, you can also become a member of our regional medical advisory panel. Uh, this is a group that is under HA International and it consists of doctors from Sudan, Zimbabwe, Senegal, Rwanda, and even South Africa. And, you know, they ask each other questions and, you know, they, they, they coalesce with each other to ensure that the patients that they have are well taken care of and well managed. And, you know, there's a lot of guidelines for better management and care for HA patients. So please reach out to Dr. Priya Bowie if you're interested in entering any of these forums or even to me as well. So what are my future aspirations as a patient? I would really want early diagnosis of children, thereby reducing child mortality. Abroad, I have seen children who die at a very young age, and I am just one of the lucky children who didn't die when I was young. So I would really wish, because HA can be detected as early as one year uh, through genetic testing, and Early diagnosis can really save uh, parents uh, from really wondering what their child is having. I would wish for there to be access to the biological therapies that are available. I would wish more doctors to join our HAEI education programs in a bit to promote, you know, fast diagnosis. I mean, more prompt diagnosis and doctors to participate in our HA doctor networks just to go an extra mile to support these patients. And we also need a lot of research. The gaps that I have shown you earlier are because there is really no research being done. There are no statistics in the region, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, we beg to wonder, is HA more prevalent in Europe and US than in Africa? I would want somebody to answer for me that question because I know that there are HA patients, but is it that th there are some genes maybe we have that make us not have as much HA as uh, people in Europe and the US? And also HAI has a lot of clinical trials that go around, but it really requires interested doctors to take up these clinical trials. We offer clinical trial uh, trials for for different countries. So it really, these are really my aspirations for my region and for Kenya as a whole. So there is a need of urgency. Why? HA is a childhood condition, though it can start at a later age, but mostly you can find 
you can pick this uh, condition from childhood. It has a 30% mortality rate for undiagnosed patients. It is debilitating and disabling, as I showed you. When I'm swollen, I can't walk, I can't work, I can't do anything. And these HA attacks actually prevent us from living a normal life. My last words to everybody in this forum is, we are rare, yes, but we are a significant number. We are there. We can be anybody, your friend, your relative, your child, but really we matter. And honestly, doctors in Kenya, you are the last best hope for patients like myself who live with rare conditions. So you are the hope for the future of patients with rare conditions. And to end my, my story, um, I would really love to give a great thanks to these doctors who I have mentioned here because I recently underwent a surgery and it was a major surgery. And because of my HAE, I was very worried whether I'm gonna make it because HAE is um, you know, triggered by surgery. And these doctors honestly worked together to just make sure that they handle my HAE properly. And I will be forever indebted to them. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Patricia. Um, it's very sobering to listen to a patient's perspective. Um, and thank you for the acknowledgement. And uh, I'll just mention those also the anesthesiologist on the team, Dr. Gatheru. Yes, who incubated uh, Patricia. And you, you know, usually uh, for HAE patients that are going to undergo uh, surgical procedures, into a laryngeal intubation is avoided as much as possible. But we had to do that in this case. Okay. Um, so I'm just looking at the chat to see whether there are any questions or comments. Um, there's someone who would like your contact. Um, she's asking whether your swellings were associated with fever. Yeah, that's a good question. So at time, as, as Dr. Priya has said, that infections can actually trigger HAE. So yes, um, I, I, I used to at times get very high fevers, but that was very rare. But, but um, I think as well as HAE coming on and pre probably the pressure of blood uh, moving, I don't know how to say, I'm not a medic, but I'm just going to try and put it in layman's language. Uh, maybe because there's a swelling somewhere, so your pressure goes up and I probably that's what that used to bring about my fevers or, or excessive sweating. Uh, I'm not too sure, but yes, I used to, I would say I would get fevers during my swellings, yes. Okay, so she says um, her son started having swellings associated with fever from nine months of age up to date. Um, he was born in 1998 and it's been affecting his cooling. Um, and the diagnosis is not known. So probably this is someone who would benefit from an evaluation and we can see how to link her up probably with Dr. Priya and yeah. HE Kenya through Patricia. Okay, um, so Dr. Ambiata asks, how available is the inhibitor? Which inhibitor, Dr. Ambiata? Is it the, are you asking about the medications? I'll assume so. Uh, maybe Dr. Priya can comment on that. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so, so, um, so what is available here? Uh, Danazol and tranexamic acid are available as prophylaxis. Um, in an emergency, FFP and tranexamic acid are available. And we are able to order um, on a named patient basis, uh, we are able to try and access Icataban, which is bradykinin uh, receptor 
antagonist. Um, but, you know, I don't, that's, that's on request. And uh, so if there are patients who are appropriate for it, then we, we can try and access. Um, and, you know, at this point in time, um, we've been able to get um, for Patricia, but, you know, in the longer term with more patients, how we are able to get and how much and would there be a cost? All, all, the, all those questions are still to be asked. But yes, we are able to request and we are, we are able to access, which is the first step in a, in, in a long journey. Okay. Um, this question will be directed to Dr. Priya. How, how do you manage the risks related with administration of tranexamic acid where frequent use is required? Well, with every medication, we have to go through the risk uh, profiles with our patients. Um, and so, I mean, that's just standard practice. So I think with any medication, whether it's tranexamic acid or, or anything else, we need to go through the risks and the benefits and weigh, weigh it out. Um, and as prophylaxis, um, if it's going to prevent my patient from having a severe HAE attack, then I'll go for it. Remember, Danazol has its own problems and we don't have any prophylactic modern medication. What we are, if if what we have is only to be used for an attack, um, and all we have is FFP and or or tranexamic acid and danazol, uh, you use what works for your patient, uh, given the risk and benefit ratio. Okay. Um, so as we wind up, uh, Dorothy Mbaiza says she's seen three patients die in her practice due to the above mentioned and wishes she knew this early and now she knows. Um, thank you. Um, finally, uh, Dr. Priya, how can a doctor refer or help a patient with suspected HAE from a rural or resource trained setting? I think the first thing is if you can access a C4 level, which is not that expensive. It's, I mean, I'm not, every, everything is expensive. It's, it, it's not, but I think a C4 level should be uh, the first thing if you think we're dealing with HAE. Um, if, if not, uh, certainly I'm happy to see them. We try and uh, help our patients with, uh, with HAE as much as we can. Um, uh, the, but, you know, the main thing is, I think you can start, there are st early steps that you can take. And I hope that the talk has given you some simple things that you can look at to uh, at least make a start on working these patients up and then uh, refer, because there are not, there are not many people who are doing this um, and, and taking it as a, as a, as a condition and working with it and working to get to a conclusion on what is the cause of the injury edema. Okay, thank you. Um, the last question is related to eczema. Uh, can inherited eczema be treated? Certainly, eczema is uh, an allergic condition and it has two as aspects to it. One is the fundamental um, skin barrier uh, issue where you've got dry skin and so that requires emollient therapy and the second aspect is the uh, allergic inflammation which gives you the itching and the rashes and so if we can identify the cause which is typically something in the diet it could be something in the environment we are then able to um, help patients by by guiding their diets and teaching them how to control their environment, uh, while at the same time maintaining the skin barrier using very good emollient therapy and preventing skin and secondary skin infections. So there's a lot that can be done for these patients. Okay, thank you.
as we wind up, I think I saw and something like some participants have their hands raised, but I don't see any other open questions on the chat. So I hope this session has been informative for everyone who attended. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Bowery, for the very good talk. And thank you, Patricia, for giving us a patient perspective. Um, and I hope we are now more knowledgeable on angioedema and hereditary angioedema. And we can actually, you know, we've been able to pick up clues to diagnosis and management or when, know when to refer so that we can improve the lives of patients who present with these phenotypes. And then we so have a bunch of questions. Um, we can stop there. Thank you. Any last Thank comments so from, from Priya? Maybe last, last <laughs> comments from Priya and then from Patricia, and then we can log off. Uh, my parting shot would be, if you have patients with angioedema, take a very, very good history, um, because I think that that, that will guide uh, your next steps. And if you're not sure what to do, call me. We can have a conversation. I'm happy to have a chat anytime on this. Okay, Patricia. So I think my last words are this. Uh, HA is manageable. I am alive uh, and I've not been alive because of myself, it's because of collaborating with good doctors. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, you as a doctor, as a healthcare professional, as a nurse, you are the last best hope really for a HA patient. Great, thank you everyone. And thanks again to Dr. Kinodia and the KNH um, Research and Programs team for hosting us today. Thank you and have a nice afternoon.